hit the record button so I don't forget to do that. Okay, uh, so welcome everybody. I'm glad to see so many people can join again for today's session. And this is the third session in our uh, Kempel Woodlock conference online series. Um, so thanks again for your participation so far and uh, welcome for welcome today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping um, rules just to review before we go move on, move on to our speaker. And that is, um, so as you join on, you're automatically muted. Um, every once in a while, I might do a mute call um, just to cut back just like right now. I'm just going to mute all, cut back on the background noise. Um, because sometimes people will slip in and out of a mute. And we do this, um, we allow you to have control of your mute button in case um, you do want to ask a question at the end and unmute yourself. So you are able to do that. Um, for There is a raise hand feature. If you see the little icon down along the bottom of the screen, there's a little smiley face um, reactions. And if you click on that, um, the top option is raise hand. Um, so, um, you know, if, if there's something pressing that Ethan is talking about that you wanted to quickly address while he's chatting, just raise your hand. Sometimes we miss it. I try to keep an eye out for it. So hopefully, hopefully I won't miss it. Um, and also at the end for uh, the question and answer period, if you would rather to speak, um, you can do it that way. And uh, a, or you can type your question in the chat box on the on the right hand side of your screen. And it's better if you type it to everybody so everyone can see your question. Um, so we avoid duplications and you can have like a little bit of a chat as well. But uh, if you prefer, you can just you can send it to me um, to me as well if you'd prefer that way. Um, and uh, also, just if you're having difficulties with reception, you might want to turn off your camera. That helps with the bandwidth. And we will be posting this uh, presentation shortly after uh, today's session. So it'll probably be up by um, tomorrow or the next day. And our previous sessions are already up online. So just go to our website main page and on the on the left, you'll see news uh, listed on the left hand bottom side of the website and you'll you'll find the presentation there. OK, so let's uh, moving right along to today's uh, presentation. Um, we have Ethan Huner who came who um, graciously came um, has offered to present today and I'm very excited to uh, hear his uh, wonderful stories. Um, so Ethan received his college education from Sir Sanford Fleming um, College School of Environmental and Natural Sciences um, in Lindsay, Ontario, and he's a graduate of both the Ecosystem and Parks and Forest Management Technician Program. Um, his education provides a strong foundation in biology of flora and fauna and natural resource management practices and principles. Ethan's passion to work with people paved the way to providing environmental and cultural education and consultation to the public, private stakeholders, and First Nation communities and organizations throughout a 10-year professional career as a naturalist in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and prior to accepting his um, um, resource technician position with the Algonquin's Ontario Consultation Office, um, where he's working now, Ethan um, had worked for Algonquin Provincial Park as an interpretive naturalist and fish and wildlife technician for the past five years. His studies and research efforts with Algonquin Park included conducting lake and fisher, fish surveys, monitoring and surveying for species at risk, turtles and birds, carnivore tracking and monitoring projects and investigating white-tailed deer migration patterns. Ethan has also participated in MNR research projects in Algonquin Park on black bear den studies, moose calf coloring and tracking and species at risk monitoring. Beyond natural science experience, Ethan has also developed a strong understanding of archaeology within Algonquin traditional territory. Working with archaeologists in the field and investing his own time on the land, he has been involved in documenting various archaeological sites and artifacts with Algonquin Park. And Ethan continues a deep connection with traditional values and life ways of Native culture. He's a grass dancer and singer who has been traveling the Pow Wow Trail for many years. And with that, welcome, Ethan. Okay, thank you very much. Boy, I guess our employee, employer's website had a long bio on there for me. That, yeah, that's my whole life story. So hopefully no one has any questions about uh, who I am or what I do. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for setting this up 
uh, for me. It's my privilege to be able to be your guest speaker uh, for the next hour. And uh, I do struggle with time limits. This is my first time doing a presentation of this nature where I'm not on a stage with a microphone in my hand or in front of a, uh, you know, people. So it feed off of just looking at myself on the screen here. I'll do my best to to work our way through uh, what I think should be an exciting uh, topic and fill your heads up more than you ever thought possible with values that you may find within your woodlots and your forests in the regions where you find yourselves living and working and playing each and every day. And depending on my uh, internet connection, which seems to wax and wane with the thinnest cloud passing the sun or who knows what the reasons are, uh, I'll just look to Astrid to maybe uh, uh, send me a chat or something if if I'm fading or something's lagging. Um, but I just want to make sure that uh, slides advance and uh, somewhat spontaneously. Um, sometimes there's a lag in doing that. So the I did change. I'm famous for last minute changes uh, titles to things. So when I put these stories together and I feel out uh, what the audience is and what I hope to get across. Uh, sometimes a different title comes to mind that more properly represents uh, the stories and the information that I'll be sharing with you and how to relate that to your to your woodlots uh, in each and every one of your practices. So indigenous cultural values in our woodlots is, is more the appropriate subject. And I use that term indigenous uh, respectfully, but also lightly, of course, uh, I have to give respect to the territory that I am within and privileged to work within the communities I represent being the Algonquin uh, in Ontario, and there's 10 communities of those Algonquins. So I always pay tribute to the, the, the memory of the ancestors of those original Anishinaabe people that were here. Uh, but also in Eastern Ontario, of course, there is uh, overlap in territory of the Haudenosaunee people, uh, the Iroquois people uh, to the south and the east along the St. Lawrence uh, River Valley. So we certainly uh, have relationship with those people as well. So I just wanted to say that Indigenous applies in a very general uh, application here to the values that we'll be discussing. They are generic, they do not belong in particular to one group of people or exclude a group of people. They are Indigenous in nature and can be found regionally across Eastern Ontario. So my role in my current employment, uh, as you've heard, I've done everything from being a professional naturalist to a fish and wildlife uh, researcher um, to working in parks to now for the last decade working for the Algonquins of Ontario on their ongoing modern treaty and land claim. Uh, there's a consultation office here in Pembroke uh, that adjoins the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, office uh, downtown Pembroke and that office is uh, serves to be the outlet for consultation and negotiations for the treaty uh, with the 10 Algonquins uh, of Ontario communities. So my role is to provide technical and expert advice to the leadership of those 10 communities on natural resource projects, uh, natural resource policy development, cultural heritage policy and project development um, to typically to ensure and protect the rights and interests of the Algonquin communities through those projects. So again, I'm only five minutes from the heart of the Algonquin Territory, which is the Ottawa River, uh, Kitchissippi, uh, the Ottawa River Valley. That's for where the wealth of this information comes from. It, it comes through me, but it comes from the land and the people uh, itself. And the knowledge that uh, I carry has, is not my own. It has been shared with me and learned uh, through the people that uh, have shared this with me through my through my journeys. So just, uh, I, I always have to properly respect and represent uh, my employer and the communities that employ me. So if you're not already aware, being an Ontario resident, there is this huge thing called the Algonquins of Ontario land claim settlement that does encompass a lot of Eastern and Central Ontario, the boundary there in orange. So depending on where you live, you, you likely live within uh, the boundaries of that settlement area. You're not aware of who all those Algonquin communities are, or where kind of geographically they're they're situated. We have the one uh, uh, First Nation community at the reserve at Golden Lake, Pickwaknagan, and then other uh, nine other uh, what you'd call non-status communities of all of Algonquin uh, collectives uh, spread across the territory. 
going to do in the next 45 to 50 minutes. That's the time limit I've given myself, five minutes of wiggle room, is to get through um, identifying and making it easy for you to identify and appreciate some examples of Indigenous cultural values, understanding what they are and, and where they may be located in the forest and, and really what to do about them if you encounter them, if you have knowledge of them, um, if you're building your awareness and appreciation for them and how to connect with what those values represent to the, to the communities that value them. I do have to do the storytelling part. I can't talk about these values without talking about how these values came to be in the landscape from an Indigenous context and land use spanning 50, well, let's go 10,000 years, at least to the last glacial uh, ice age that covered this area of North America. Indigenous people are certainly say they were here even before and they just moved around on Turtle Island and then reoccupied the lands after the ice left. So it's a long story that I'll try to do in just a couple of minutes. Um, I will give you those specific examples within your woodlots of these generic values that you may find. And I also want to increase your what I call archaeological awareness. So your understanding of if there are values, where are they most likely to be found given what your landscape or geology uh, or uh, ecology may be on your properties. And then of course, we'll leave time for some questions at the end. I'm hoping um, with the, the body of people that are there, we can get through some questions in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, so just give you a little 101 on what indigenous cultural values are. Well, literally, they can be anything. They can be uh, a landscape that holds spiritual, uh, almost religious value uh, based on the view of the land itself, the history and the use of that land, such as a cliff face where there may be sacred rock paintings beneath it, a place where people maybe travel to the top of those cliffs to get a look of their forest and a lay of the land and to see what was coming and going up and down and the tributaries to those water bodies. Perhaps it's a place where ceremonies were held where people did fasting on top of those cliffs to commune with uh, what we call the manadus, the spirits that reside within the trees, the plants, the animals, the rocks themselves. So cultural value can be a whole entire landscape or it can be one individual component of that landscape. It could be a few rocks sitting on top of another large rock and to the passerby it doesn't strike anything odd. To the trained eye, you may understand that those rocks were placed there for a specific purpose. They were placed there to, to mark a trail, to mar mark a path, to allow others to know why they're headed in a certain direction. These are wayfinding points or place markers. We're going to go into examples of these. Modifications, huge modifications to the bark on the tree, to the wood of the tree, where things were extracted for certain material uses in the past. There may be still evidence of that existing on forest uh, resources on your properties. A cultural value can be an individual plant or a colony of plants such as uh, wild ginger for its various uses. And I apologize uh, because I'm on my work computer, work emails pop up uh, almost every two seconds. And I can't turn the notification sound off. So if you hear these little dinglings in the background, that, are, that is my email communications. The values can be an area such as where there were uh, historical occupations of Indigenous people and where Indigenous people chose to camp were not just randomly selected, they're very uh, logistically and strategically located uh, for access to fish and wildlife most, most, uh, most particularly. So things like narrows or points and peninsulas were great places uh, for wildlife to cross, for fish to cong congregate. And it was the place most likely to um, influence where the indigenous people would reside. So an area like this has a high potential to have archeological resources, uh, cultural heritage resources dotted throughout the landscape. So understanding the features of your land can lend towards the possibility, a higher possibility of having more of these values within your woodlots or not. Most of us are aware through whatever education we received that uh, the indigenous people of this region of Ontario and elsewhere on Turtle Island were 
uh, intrinsically connected with the forests and the forest resources and the waterways of those forests. The two were inseparable. The identity is, of one is based on the other. They were truly part of that land and that landscape. And that uh, the footprint that was left there after 10,000 years of residing in that forested environment is surprisingly very sparse. It was a light life on the land. And there isn't, as a result, a lot of evidence that is there for us to see. But the land holds that. It retains that memory. It retains that uh, physical memory through the objects that may be there. Uh, that information of the ancestors is, is there throughout the majority of the areas that we live, work, and reside in. So this is an ancient story, and I'm, I'm not going to go too much into it. I mean, I do have an archaeological background, and I do love the ancients and how that shapes our, our the world that we see today, the forest communities that we see. But uh, we'll, we'll start with Indigenous life going back after the re retreat of that last glacier ice age and the impacts that it had that, you know, somewhat two kilometer thick sheet of ice inching across the land base, scouring, bulldozing its way through. And then the retreat of that glacier, the rebounding, the upward movement of the land after that pressure and weight was released, and then the drainage of that huge amount of ice pouring across the land base, filling up all the low spots, the valleys, the basins, and even the influx of the Atlantic Ocean into our region of Ontario. It's all part of that ancient story of how the Indigenous people came to utilize their land and where they left the remnants of their lifestyle as they as they lived throughout the millennia. It's hard for you to look at your woodlot, uh, and I encourage you to try this imagery. Uh, wherever you are, whether you're driving down the side of the highway, whether you're going up through the back 40 to the bush, but picture your forest without trees. Literally, all of Ontario was without after the glaciers went through and scoured everything off. It was a very tundra grassland, kind of an open parkland-like ecosystem that you would find at the uh, kind of the interface of the tree line with the Arctic tundra. That's how most of Ontario looked. So you find those large boulders in your woods and uh, you don't see it in the context to the whole landscape because you have to picture that landscape without the trees there. If you can see your landscape like this and understand how the game moved, how the people moved, where they would situate themselves in that landscape, then you can really zero in on your own forest and picture where could those pockets of, of places be that would have been of most interest to an Indigenous person who may be traveling or, or living in your area some thousands or hundreds of years ago. Maybe it's hard for you to believe that there were herds of caribou that uh, migrated all over Ontario woodland caribou. Uh, these were following the recession of the glacial, uh, the ice front as it moved north and all that grassland and all those dormant seeds sprung up from the earth, especially in those saturated, uh, saturated estuaries. Huge herds of caribou would congregate. And this is really what the people were following. 9,000 years ago, there weren't white-tailed deer, there weren't moose, there were herds of caribou. And we find implements throughout the Rideau Lakes area, even as far as Bancroft, uh, symbolizing that caribou hunting lifestyle that occurred that long ago. So picture that going through your forests in East, Eastern Ontario. It takes a lot of uh, visualization and you, you can't find the clues to, to make that real to you, but know that it was very, very real and did occur and that the people were here following those species uh, throughout Eastern Ontario, following those herds of large game, uh, living on the land in a very nomadic fashion, living lightly, carrying their belongings with them and setting down whenever there was an abundance of resources to take advantage of. And if you don't believe my storytelling, I mean, uh, a BS doesn't always mean Bachelor of Science. I, I, it might be uh, something else, uh, but uh, the, the rocks don't lie. And we find these rocks, special rocks made of chert, flint, that were shaped by the earliest Indigenous people to occupy Ontario, going back, like I said, to about 9,000 years ago. The image on the left is from a deer hunter walking an oak ridge outside of Bancroft and finding in that deer trail an ancient spear point, 9,000 years old, made of chert from Michigan. So these people were traveling with that product into Ontario following these caribou and hunting them. The uh, archaeological uh, 
image on the right is from a collection of ancient Clovis artifacts from the Rideau Lakes area, again, about 9,000 years ago. That's just after the glaciers left. That's after the glaciers are pouring their meltwater through uh, the Great Lakes, uh, the Ottawa River Valley, the St. Lawrence River Valley, and there's herds of caribou everywhere. And that's what the people are living off of and surviving off of. This happened in your backyards. I like map. I like digital elevation maps. This one wasn't produced to show you that ancient story, but it does its job. So if you're to picture two things in this area, think of all the green sometime as being underwater. Sometime all of that green was inundated or exposed to either running or standing water. The yellow were the highest points, the elevations that water did not reach. So at one time, the ancient Great Lakes that were blocked by the ice dam of the glaciers filled in those huge, huge basins. The Atlantic Ocean, all the way from the Atlantic came up the St. Lawrence Seaway as we know it, but it covered that whole dark green area to the right, all the way into Lake Ontario, all the way up the Ottawa River Valley as far as deep river. We had ocean water, marine water, whales, seals, salmon, and people were living much like the Inuit people of the north uh, would have been living, but here 9,000 years ago. So picture that all that green area being underwater at one time and all as a result of that glacial activity. So to see your forest today, you have to understand and appreciate those processes that all contributed to what on the landscape today. This is a little uh, just data I pulled off our, uh, our, our GIS. Uh, information for the Algonquins of Ontario. The only reason I'm showing you this is to pay attention to that western, or sorry, the red line. The red line symbolizes the western extent of the Champlain Sea. The Atlantic Ocean came that far into Ontario and basically stopped wherever you see that, that red boundary. So you'll see most of eastern Ontario was under the Champlain Sea, the Atlantic Ocean at one point in time. So the shorelines of water bodies today are nothing like the shorelines of the water bodies that were there 10,000, 9,000, 8,000 years ago, but people are still utilizing those shorelines in the same way. I'm hearing some feedback uh, after, I'm not sure why, or if it's just on my end, I'm hearing my own voice like a second time. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I'll just mute everybody to make sure um, in case there's someone okay. unmuted. I can put up with hearing my own voice. Oh, no, that sounds <laughs> better. Excellent. But it sounds it sounds great for me, hopefully. And I haven't heard anything from anybody, so I'm assuming okay. it sounds good. Perfect. So I always use landscape photos and then try to illustrate for you what you're what you can't see because we can't well, not yet anyways, transport yourself back in time to actually witness what the land, the forest are doing. But picture this uh, huge granite knob over a river. The river is at its modern shoreline today, but there's actually a, we call a strand line or a beach line at the very top of that cliff that shows us where the water levels were some 400 feet up after the glaciers were melting. So basically all that was available to people for a period of hundreds if not thousands of years were the very tops of the highest points of land. Yes, those are my very poor illustrations of uh, the fish that might have resided in those deep waters 400 feet deep. Um, but these changes in the landscape, they are in line with the, the stories of the creation of the land itself. Those uh, Turtle Island creation stories, how the turtle offered its back for Earth to be created in various forms on, on, on the back of the turtle. Well, the backs of the turtle were these humps of land that stuck up out of those actual great floods because that was the only place where human life and animal life could reside for those periods of time. So oral tradition is very closely linked to actual earth history and climate history and environmental history that took place on our landscapes. Your own Nashoni from the, the, the St. Lawrence uh, River watershed or Anishinaabe or Algonquin from the Ottawa River and the Great Lakes, Southern Great Lakes watershed, two different origin stories, but both talk about the earth being flooded and the back of a turtle being offered to support that, that new life uh, being given. I won't go into the teachings 
Uh, that's not uh, what I'm here to do uh, on today, but I just wanted to share a bit of those oral traditions because they are closely linked to the values of the landscape today. They do go back, these stories and legends, back many thousands of years. And the, and the, proof, in the, or the proof is in the rocks, if you don't uh, believe uh, my background or the stories that I share, you can't, uh, you can't deny the grandfathers, those rocks and the stories that they tell. You may have rocks like this on your landscape that show where water has carved or etched lines into the rock as it flowed by like this boulder on top of this river valley. 300 feet up above the, the river valley, you find a boulder shaped by running water. So that river was once covering that whole entire landscape that you see. So you learn to look at your land, your forest in a different way to help interpret the stories and the information they hold. And again, this all ties back into that rock itself would be a value to an indigenous person. It's a value just to have that on your property today because it tells that whole history of the land and where people might have been. It's not a rock you'd wanna push off to the side of the road or something like that if you're, you're making a forest access trail or something. So continuing that ancient story of, of land use in our forest, what we know is our current environment, the diversity of plant life that we see, the water being where it is today, all of that really took place between five and 6,000 years ago when the climate uh, stabilized, we had this temperate climate and the diversity that we see. Yes, there was ups and downs and lots of different diversity before that, but the water has been, the climate has been basically where was, let's not get into climate change, uh, ongoing climate change, but this scene has been seen in Algonquin territory uh, in your neck of the woods for the last 6,000 years. And because things stabilized, so did the lives of the indigenous people. They could go into their patterns of life and living. They could revisit the same sites year after year after year after year without change. There weren't massive floods sending them up 400 foot up the top of a hill to camp and then two generations later, moving back down to the bottom of the valley after the waters left. Everything stabilized in this area in Ontario about five or six. Ago. And that cyclical nomad, semi-nomadic way of life of the indigenous people in Ontario really took its pace from that point on, using the waters as the transport routes, the highways for trade, for, for food, uh, those waterways in the forest adjacent to them were what defined the life of the indigenous people in Ontario. Selected to live, to occupy for short periods of time or long periods of time, were those selected very close to the water bodies for access, for a view of that water body and the surrounding forest, for a view of the resources that were there and for your own protection. The indigenous people were never far away from those primary water sources. And if you have those primary water sources, in or around your property, that influences whether or not there may be indigenous uh, settlements, camps, people using uh, your area. So in the summertime, the confluences of those water bodies, small or large, were very important. Where two water bodies came together was a place where indigenous people gathered in larger numbers. Their summer encampments may be from, you know, tens or dozens of families to a few hundred families. And uh, this would be a scene that you probably saw as the first fur trader or French explorer priests moving up the uh, St. Lawrence or the Ottawa Valley uh, 400 plus years ago. And that scene would have been seen for about 4,000 years ago before that. After summer in the fall, that's when those big villages broke up into their family groups, their extended family units, and they went up the tributaries, large or small, into the, the interior lands, the forests, the lakes, the river valleys of the, the interior of the territory for the rest of the winter for the, for the fish, uh, uh, fur trapping and uh, big game harvesting purposes. Would have been, well, there's a traditional Algonquin harvester nowadays and a traditional Algonquin harvester in those days. Uh, moose hunting, big game hunting since the time of the caribou on to the deer and the moose has always been unprevalent in Ontario. Those winter long months of moose hunting or living off the game that you had secured in seasons previously 
the spring breakups signify the time to move into those stands of sugar maple. Those sugar bushes for the Algonquin people were always located very close to the winter hunting and trapping grounds to eliminate the need to travel far, set up new camps, etc. So anywhere where you have sugar bush today and maybe had sugar bush uh, back then, and you're associated with a primary water source, a travel route for Indigenous people, the chances are that even if that sugar bush isn't hundreds and hundreds of years old, uh, before that, it certainly might have been, and there could have been an Indigenous encampment, whether it be Haudenosaunee or Anishinaabe, going to these stands of maples, even silver maple along riparian uh, river valleys, and securing that, uh, that sweet water to turn into sugar for all the uses they would need. So this lifestyle of continuing a subsistence living, returning to similar locations throughout the territory according to the seasons in your travels, but to the same points on the same piece of land year after year after year, generation after generation after generation has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And people are often questionable about, well, there are so many people and they're here for so long, just why don't we see more evidence then? Why isn't it everywhere? Again, the footprint was very light. It was not European lifestyle that we brought to this continent. It wasn't whole clearing of the land. It wasn't plowing of the field. It wasn't erecting stone fences everywhere. It was back to the earth from the earth. Very little evidence remains of these time periods. Stories and tone are about all the tangible physical evidence we, we have to be able to tell these stories. So no, there's been 10,000 years of indigenous history in your forest and talking about indigenous values, literally they can be and are anywhere within your forest. And I wanna turn now to exploring just some of the examples of maybe the most readily available and readily identifiable values that you may find within your forest or your woodlots and not only how to identify them, but to do with that information. What do you do when you find a value or how do you treat that or how do you protect it or why? I mean, all of these, I think, really add value. It's an added value to your woodlot having these values, not just the value of the wood, the forest itself, uh, but the stories and the cultural memory that are maintained. Stones are an easy one. You can find this anywhere. We're gonna talk a little bit about stone features of cultural values. I'm not talking about every boulder. There are significant boulders that were almost magnets to people. People congregated near them, close to them for various purposes. You have something like this on your property, whether it's a piece of fallen cliff that's rolled down from uh, the ridge top above, or whether it's a large glacial erratic that was pushed there and deposited there by a glacier, People magnetized to those. They were blinds for hunting, an easy place to hide behind and uh, ambush prey. They were great windbreaks to have a campfire against or shelter. There's usually a dry side to them. Uh, there were places for caching meat, cold storage inside the cracks and fissures of the rock, etc. So there can be archaeological evidence found around such rocks like this, and it's important in woodlots and a lot of the information I give to the forest industry is to limit the ground disturbance around these features. If you have them, uh, pretend or predict that there could be archeological evidence or materials around it and do your best to keep that ground intact. I mean, maybe 10 meters around such a feature may be good enough. Um, the stuff is pretty close to these boulders that's there, but just consider that these have a different context to the indigenous people today because they know how their ancestors uh, utilized uh, and, and respected these rocks like this on the land base. Again, a different uh, large glacial erratic on the top of a hill in an oak forest, no other big boulders around. You have a view of the river valley in all directions. There is no way that people traveling through there did not see that boulder and did not go there uh, for, for different purposes. Uh, and, and probably left some information of their passing there and around that feature. Some Indigenous people treat these as uh, Thunderbird rocks. They believe these large round rocks on the top of hills, hilltops or, or uh, ridgetops 
uh, where the uh, the spiritual eggs of that spiritual figure, that cultural figure that is known as the Nimkibaneshi, the, the Thunderbird, the Thunder Being. Rocks may be, uh, we call them uh, petroforms. They have a shape of something. Either they've been physically created like that or nature's created them. They, they look like animals. They, they represent animals like a snapping turtle head. Certainly there would be some cultural information in the forest behind that snapping turtle head jutting out of the, the water to the right. But maybe a turtle head or a snake head coming out of a pile of rocks to the image on the top left. Forests that surround nature could have cultural values. I don't know what that boulder is on the bottom, but it's. I certainly found a lot of artifacts around it, about 300 feet up on a ridge. It looks like it was carved, uh, not just by nature, and it was shimmed up with rocks to maintain its position. Um, it faces to the east, which is interesting. Directly, you can put your compass on it and the face looks east. So just look at things with a different lens. I don't usually put pictures like this uh, of, of departed, uh, people from the past, but it's important to understand that piles of rocks aren't just piles of rocks. Yes, sometimes a tree falls over, rocks fall out of its roots and forms a pile. Uh, very rarely are those in well-placed, compact stones with a large stone on one end and the shape is elongated or oval. And there was four of these uh, in a row, and this is not a farm clearance pile. The, these are These are graves. And it's not important if you find something like this on your woodlot, uh, that it be indigenous or non-indigenous. The fact is this could be a potential burial site for the earliest occupants of that piece of land. The trees growing out of that, the trees going around that, the soil itself are all sacred ground. And it's very important um, if you're not notifying a Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Sport, if you're not notifying an archaeologist, if you're not notifying a local First Nation community uh, for fear of what does that mean for managing your property, make sure that you protect this. Make sure that it's known to you and your family and that respect is given to that, that site so that damage doesn't happen to it. Maybe if your land passes on, it's important to let the next owners of the property know that that value is there and talk about that respect and why it's protecting that is so important. Stone piles can be burials quite often. There's other types of stone piles. I mean, people leave these all over today. Hunters and trappers still do this. Oh my goodness, everybody on the side of the highway does this. Every trail in Algonquin Park, people do this. But they've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. And there is a difference between very old stone piles from 100 years ago to 1,000 years ago and beyond to the ones people are just erecting because they think it's a cultural icon today and everybody needs to know where you've been and what you're doing. Well, people have been doing that social communication for thousands of years. So if you find features like this, yeah, maybe it's a township marker. Sure, maybe it's the marker of an old caribou trail 9,000 years ago. Maybe it's Trapper Joe or Trapper John uh, family 100 years ago. Maybe it's Indigenous John or Joe from 200 years ago. The fact is, falling trees around this, you knock these over, you, you can't just put them back together. You can't give that feature the same context as they were created a hundred, a thousand, thousands of years ago. The respect, the information that con is contained there is lost. So it's very important if you find these to, to document them, to have them assessed by a First Nations person or a forestry technician or something like that, that can reach out to uh, cultural experts and help analyze that and say, no, that's probably 50 years old. It's probably your, uh, uh, your great grandfather did that, or yes, it may be older than that and be indigenous. These stone features are all over the landscape. One of the most common features that you can find representing uh, ancient cultural values. Another, uh, that's my mom up on top of a hill, about 400 foot, uh, 400 pound rock flipped over representing a bear. Old fire hearths can still be found uh, exposed in the soil. Fire rings in your forest. And if there isn't charcoal there uh, or beer cans, et cetera, et cetera, and these are really embedded into the ground and sunken in, could be a generation more, it could be 500 generations old. But the importance of that little fire ring is that someone spent time in that area 
and there could be artifacts associated with that in your woodlot. Won't get into these features too much, but in oak forest, if you have oak forest, people have been pounding acorns for hundreds of thousands of years. I find these grindstones quite often on crown land exploring uh, for archaeological reasons. Uh, grooves that were pecked into a rock and a large grindstone that was used to crush shells and acorns or a flat rock with a round rock on top of it, again for grinding and pounding out the, uh, the meal of the acorn from the husk of the acorn itself to be gathered and further refined for food. I'm going to skip that. I just look at times. Sometimes I speed up, sometimes I slow down. And I'll probably go for another 10 minutes for sure. Rock crops and, and rock faces, uh, people were magnetized to those, to those spots as well, either for extracting certain types of stone minerals to fashion for tools, or because it created a really nice path and an easy place to walk through the forest. Important not to disturb or cut things right up to those areas because, again, there may be cultural artifacts left in the ground from the passing of the people going there for those resource purposes. I'll skip caves, but you can imagine all the things that were done in caves. You know, people that have come to me from Eastern Ontario that have caves in their properties, uh, explaining how they have heard Indigenous people using them. And again, certain features like a long square stone wall are not Indigenous, but still can tell the story of the landscape and how it changed over time. And it may be an important value to you in your woodlot. The one gentleman I was walking with that showed me that old stone field, that's his family's property from 350 years ago. And we were out looking for birch trees uh, for an Indigenous new builder. Hundreds of birch trees, and we only found one that was, was suitable. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about birch trees because birch is, a uh, not a commodity. I mean, birch is common. Canoe birch are not common. I mean, out of 200 birch trees, maybe there's one that has the right for an Indigenous canoe builder. There are many people still building these canoes like their ancestors have for thousands of years today. They can't carry on that craft if they don't have access to bark. So it's possible if you have trees of the right dimensions on your property that you could invite a person from a nearby community to come and look at that tree and decide whether they'd like to harvest that bark. It doesn't matter if you're looking to get the veneer of the wood uh, for the value of that tree. Certainly both possibilities exist. You can harvest that tree and remove the bark. Someone can build a birch bark canoe like their ancestors have done, and the tree can still go to the mill or to the firewood pile, et cetera, et cetera. So I got a lot of my time walking woodlots, people's private woodlots, crown land, uh, forest, uh, helping tree markers, et cetera, identify uh, these birch trees and the dimensions and the types of characteristics that make a really good canoe birch. They are hard to find. We are running out of them uh, and they're not growing into these monsters as they once were not allowing a forest to reach that state in a lot of cases. But in protected areas in anyone's woodlot, if you have the right uh, conditions, you may have some of these monster birch. And I don't mean they have to be monster. You can't, if you can wrap your arms around them, uh, that might be a good one. If you can't, that's probably a good size to think about. Very few birch like this remaining on the landscape. Just an old historic photo of an uh, indigenous couple harvesting the bark from a, a tree. So you can see the dimension, the diameter of the tree that they were harvesting. Really, you, you need the bark to be about a uh, half centimeter thick at minimum, maybe a centimeter thick is the best. Uh, the rest though can be used for basket making. So maybe you have birch that could supply a whole basket making workshop for a First Nations community, just off the birch that you may be cutting for firewood off your woodlot. So always think about trees, species in a different value to different people. Wood, uh, firewood is, is not the value that indigenous people treat for the birch tree. We run courses, the Algonquin communities do, their birch bark builders do for forest industries, pr private stakeholders to show this process from start to finish. If you're interested in that in the future, there's contacts that I can give you and I encourage you to, it's easy to do it. Which First Nations are in your, your, your area. And uh, if anyone is interested in utilizing birch for traditional craft, this is a canoe made last by my good friend Steve Hunter, who's uh, the 
uh, community leader for the Algonquin community in Bancroft. He's keeping an art form, uh, unbelievable style, but that birch tree came from uh, a woodlot owner's property. And imagine bark coming from your forest, turning into a museum grade specimen like that. And he's still going out fishing and wild rice harvesting in that vessel. There's other things, your bird so valuable the communities, education centers, museums for these recreations of that original way of life. You can do this on your own property, but it's more fitting to do that in a public venue with products that came from your forest to help support uh, Indigenous awareness and respect. Not going to get to this, but the birch is so sacred to the Indigenous people, especially the Anishinaabe. It even bears the mark, uh, the black wings, triangular shape, downward pattern. That's the mark of the Thunderbird. And there's an old story about Nanabush and the Thunderbird. I won't get into that, but that tree bears that symbolic relationship between the first person and the Thunderbirds, the fight that ensued, the protection of the birch tree that was forever offered to the Anishinaabe people, the Indigenous people, and that the tree still bears the mark of the triangular wings of the Thunderbird to this day. Won't talk about chaga, a very important and sacred medicine, but that's another gift that comes from the birch tree. And if you're harvesting birch or you find these, um, I wouldn't say collect it all, but if you're not using it, I will say almost every Indigenous community has somebody that's making traditional medicines and would love to have access to chaga. Great cedar, canoe grade cedar. Birch, camp, a birch canoe cannot be made without a good piece of cedar. Finding a cedar tree like you see on the left is a rarity. A big cedar that is actually straight and does not grow with a twist or a spiral to its grain is really hard to find. If you have a cedar grove or a cedar stand, Algonquins only need something, you know, 18 inches in diameter, but it needs to be straight and not have many branches for the first 12 to 20 feet. Uh, and that's to make, you split it, you keep splitting it, you keep quartering it, you keep quartering it. Those become your gunnel canoes. Those become the strips and the strapping for the canoes on the insides, become all the other parts for your canoe. Yeah. Birch and cedar go together. And a lot of these canoe grade specimens are being found on private woodlots. And um, it's important that we increase the, the understanding and the knowledge out there for woodlot owners that these trees can still be used uh, for other purposes, but sometimes one or two can be donated or gifted, or you can have this whole workshop learning experience on your own property from engaging with Indigenous communities. To see in our forests is people not understanding the, the other values that their own private lands have to other people and gifts that can be shared in that spirit of the agreement, that sacred agreement made between the uh, Indigenous people and the first settlers was to share our resources. Uh, cutting down a big, huge birch that could have turned into a canoe um, and instead turning, leaving it season and turning it into a firewood. Uh, the firewood could have been got, but that community lost an opportunity to build a birch bark canoe. And I'm constantly stopping at people's houses when I see piles of birch at the end of their driveways, uh, firewood, et cetera, et cetera, and saying, teach them about birch and about there's probably 10 birch in this pile that could have went to build about five birch bark canoes. Still could have got the firewood. Modifications on, on trees. If there were indigenous people using your lands, even the last couple hundred years, few hundred years, sometimes there's blaze marks. Sometimes on cedar trees, you'll find where a whole strap of the tree has been removed, cut, pulled a plank off the cedar tree next to a portage route, next to a river perhaps, um, those can tell you, those help tell you that there are people in your area utilizing the land. Definitely protect those trees. Sorts of culturally modified trees. Trees were trained and twisted and bent when they were young to grow a certain way so that they became a land marker, a trail marker to people, directional pointers, all sorts of different reasons, graveyard markers, uh, if you find these trees, it's not just because another tree fell in the tree when it was young, broke off some branches, bent it over, and it grew like that. Certainly, that's a possibility, but it's also, if you know where your land is and what the possibilities are for people utilizing it, 
that those could have been marker trees made by people using your landscape, uh, who knows, a few hundred years ago. Uh, skip shush camps. There's other tree species too uh, that are really important. Basswood is a really common one. Uh, I like to use this more appropriate common name for it. It's not a misspelling, but uh, it definitely uh, shows all of the amazing qualities that this tree has. And again, it can form a unique partnership with the First Nation communities. Wood can go for processing for whatever you may need it for, or the market may need it for, just to make space, but that bark is where the value is. Yes, you can eat the buds if you're hungry too. And, uh, absolutely delicious, tastes like cabbage. The inner bark is made for rope. The inner bark is what we make all of the fish nets from, all the ties and lashings from uh, plant fiber. Basswood is about the best. It does not rot in water. Therefore, perfect for fishing nets. Or long fishing nets back in the day made out of basswood bark. Imagine weaving that together, or collecting all that inner bark from the basswood tree. So if you're falling basswood, huge pile of bark laying there, or let someone come in and take that bark again, a First Nation community may want to utilize that resource. It runs these traditional skills um, in around Peterborough for a First Nation. They got the youth together and they built a whole traditional wigwam out of the, the bark of, of large diameter basswood trees. So again, from private property owners to the gift to the larger community and regifting back to the Indigenous peoples. I'll skip a few of the common ones here, but uh, even the common trees like poplar you may consider them as junk trees or just good for some stinky firewood or something like that. But the, you make baskets out of the bark really, really easily. There's things that you can just do for fun on your properties to keep some traditional skills alive, uh, even with your own hands doing the crafting. Black ash, black ash swamps are for basket makers. Algonquins, Iroquois, all are famous for their black ash. Even the earliest settlers who would have learned that here, uh, some of the, the tricks of the trade from the indigenous people. Black ash on your property can be used, the finest specimens for gifting to a community for making uh, basketry. Sumac, it grows on every trail side or forest opening or old field. It's not just for the lemonade that you would make out of the berries. Original maple, maple sugar tap. The inside of the, the branches are corky pith, spongy pith. You just scoop that out and that was hammered into a slice under the tree bark and that was your, your maple syrup tap. The same thing was done with uh, elderberry. All these pieces of traditional knowledge probably exist on your property and it adds value to that indigenous cultural story of your forest and of your lands. I have to have a little black spruce bog. Black spruce was made for your smokehouse lodges, uh, your, your wigwam supports. The roots are what lashes canoes together. You pull the black spruce roots up out of that sphagnum moss, strip it down. Original chewing gum, your antiseptic for mouth ailments, and that was your glue for the birch bark canoes, for your baskets, for all your tools. So many people would slice the black spruce, keep returning to those wounds and collecting sap over periods of time. You can see all the diagonal slices on this old uh, black spruce where traditional crafters keep returning uh, to open up new wounds on certain trees and collect that. But literally, values can be anywhere. I can't break it down to you enough, and I'm not going to have time to go through how to increase your archeological awareness of where all these sites can be and the information where they can be found. But you do have this slideshow and the purpose of this next section is that I actually included the types of archeological information that if you have property located close to these landscape features, you have a higher potential for having cultural values, archeology span located in your forest to change your perspectives, to keep your eyes open to places close to beach shorelines, places with great views along waterways or overlooks, narrows or funnels that allow game to cross for where First Nations hunters would have positioned themselves. If you're anywhere near rapids where there would have been portages, 
you would have cultural values in your forest. If people had to walk in your forest to avoid the rapids in the water, they left stuff behind. They camped at the ends of those portages. They harvested resources while traveling. You have open oak forests that face a southern exposure. A lot of those areas were old ancient shorelines uh, where the water once ran. And these were great places for, uh, because they're oak and have been managed for oak over time, even by fire. Uh, great places for wildlife and great places for harvesting wildlife. And where people were doing that year after year after year, they left behind the tools of their trade. You'll see lots of stone markers in forests and oak forests for that reason. And you'll hear me sing ancient shorelines a lot. And what I'm talking about is where there are physical evidence of water creating those ancient uh, banks of rivers that no longer exist from thousands of years ago. Oh, annotate. Oh, oh, annotate. I probably have a way to do that. I see an annotate button. I don't know if that's what I'm looking for. Is, is there something there that shows something moving? Okay, annotating. Let's see. Anything there moving around the screen? No big arrow. No, boxing, start annotating. There's a okay. tiny arrow beside it. Yeah, it's a tiny arrow. Uh, okay. So, oh, yeah, yes. So you're if pointing. You, if, you're, if you want to point at something, we can see that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just showing the edge of this old yeah. old shoreline. So anywhere along the shoreline where it's flat would have been great camping sites uh, and where archaeological material can be located. Again, important not to disturb the soil in these areas that could be holding those ancient artifacts. Okay, so now annotating, it won't let me fast forward the slide. So I just got to stop that here. Yeah. Those ridges that you sit on for overlook sometimes are actually the old shorelines to the rivers and the lakes down below. Uh, many of you have probably seen places like this, but never thought that that was the edge of the water a long time ago. These are where the oldest, oldest artifacts and cultural values are located. Outcrops of different types of mineralization, especially quartz in Eastern Ontario, that was the stone tool builders choice material. We didn't have a lot of chert and flint. The Canadian Shield, we had quartz. And anywhere you find that quartz, you might find workshops where you find pieces of quartz laying over the ground as it was broken down into smaller pieces. This was not anything nature did. This is what some indigenous group did uh, probably 7,000 years ago, and then refined those chunks of quartz even further down to flakes. And eventually, from those big blocks, uh, quarried blocks down into these fine tools that sometimes I find at the base of my feet when I'm looking and walking through these kind of open oak forest with exposed mineral soil. This could be in your backyard. Things like this that are thousands and thousands of years old exist in your forest. You have to learn the story of the land and where to look. And there's a big uh, granite, uh, call it a caribou butchering knife found outside of Caledar, Ontario, up on an oak ridge a long time ago by myself and just propped it up for a good picture. Being here, no matter what your forest looks like, no matter where it's located, the stories and the use and the memory of the Indigenous people exist in the soil, in the trees themselves, in the stands, forest, in the rocks that cover the surface, you just have to change and switch and sometimes flip your perspective to see your land in a different way, to see the values that exist sometimes right before your eyes. Think about those things the next time you take a walk, but there are other footsteps undoubtedly that walk that land before you, whether it be your own family, the families before, or the first indigenous people. And I hope, if anything, I was able to increase your understanding with the examples provided. Build your head up with swirling ideas of what ifs and possibilities and, oh, I have that or I've seen that or maybe I need to go for another walk through my woods and see what I have. 
that's the spark that I'm trying to, to give to you. That's the type of information I'm trying to fill you up with that if these values are encountered in your forests, in your wood lots, that there are a value perhaps not just to you and your forest, but they can be a value to the larger community and more importantly, to the indigenous community that could have a two-way sharing, a two-eyed uh, two way of seeing your forest and help utilize and carry on traditions that have existed in your forest for thousands of years before. So I'm gonna stop there. I know we just hit one o'clock. I should have gave myself a full hour to talk um, and people are probably getting hungry for lunch. Uh, but if you would like to stay, I'm, I'm staying for as long as it takes, but I'll turn it over to Astrid for uh, questions. Thank you, Ethan. Um, that was uh, fantastic. And I, I really like your final message of preserve the story of your land. That's uh, mm. a really important message. And I don't know about the other woodland owners on this group, but I can't wait to go out with my dad in, in the spring and, and Oh, well, actually, when we top maple trees and yeah, just start looking at things a little bit differently, especially around those large rocks. Uh, we've got a lot of those and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty excited. That, that was really uh, super. Thank you. Um, and, and we will turn over to questions. Um, and, and as Ethan indicated, he's graciously, uh, um, he's graciously willing to stay a little bit later to address any questions um, and just to, it is uh, one o'clock or just a little after. So before we head over to questions, I just, um, I know some people need to leave. So just a quick thank you again um, for everybody uh, who's taking off. Um, thank you for participating. And we've got one more seminar uh, next Wednesday. So check it out on our website um, for information and to register. And I'm just going to plop up as we do questions. I'm just going to put up our sponsorship screen um, to thank and acknowledge all the sponsors that made this uh, happen, that allowed this to happen, all these events. So thank you to all our sponsors, and we'll move over to the questions. Um, lots of kudos. Excellent presentation. Well done. Thank you for the excellent presentation and thoughts. A thought provoking look at the forest. Um, where do we go to learn more? Someone has asked. I was wondering That's, the same thing. If I can answer that for really quickly for the benefit to all, because I'm sure that's on people's minds. Uh, I, I hate only recommending people go to, to web. It's often a, a very first place to start. Uh, the Algonquins of Ontario as, as a whole, uh, and I'll, I'll Give this to Astrid so, some email addresses following the presentation that could be sent out to the email list. But uh, Tana Kiwin, it's T A N A K I W I N, Tana Kiwin, which is a homeland, Tanakuin, uh, in the uh, Anishinaabe Moan uh, language. Um, that's the Algonquins website uh, for, the, for the land claim, but there's a lot of natural resource information there. Uh, Plenty Canada, that's down the Lenark area. Certainly, Larry McDermott is a is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Chris Craig at uh, South Nation Conservation, uh, reach out because there's connections there of South Nation with the Old uh the Iroquois people, uh, Mohawk people at uh, Cornwall and Aquasasne, um, who are phenomenal in their environmental department about managing. Uh, indigenous values and their knowledge of indigenous values. There's not a one sort of guide or book to do it all with. It's it's through practice. It's through exposure, uh, and that's that's the best I can do for just quickly trying to give you some directions to to those entities. Oh, and as I was sharing something, I just lost. Uh... <laughs> I lost the chat box. So give me a second here. Can you see my image? The image uh, that I'm sharing of the sponsors. Does that show up? It does. And I do okay. see Self Nations even on there. That's... Yeah, 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 yeah. And Chris Craig, he's a, yep, we work well with Chris Craig. Um, but I have now lost, but I have to stop sharing it because otherwise I can't figure out how I, <laughs> there's my chat box. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, and just in follow up with that, actually, I had one question, Ethan, is if we have um, if we have some of these 
identify features that we'd like to get in touch with our local Indigenous um, um, contacts. Uh, well, I guess you've given some, I'll post, and just for everybody's benefit, I'll post those um, resources that you've indicated. I'll post that in the, on the same page where we're going to post the link for this presentation um, and the recording. Uh, I guess just how is the how is it best to preserve um, some of these artifacts? And I think specifically birch trees. If you see, um, so a lot of the times a tree is being harvested, as, as you indicate, for whatever reason. Um, and but there's maybe some great bark on there that could be of use. Is it too late if it's dry? Um, can you take this dry bark and contact someone, or does it have to be sort of live still? It's the same with ash, yeah. black ash as well. Yeah, black ash is is fine because yet you, you have to dry it and, and season it for quite a while before you you smash it with a a sledgehammer on the butt end and you shatter and separate all the annual rings, which will be the strips that you use. Uh, so you you need it to be dry to do that. But birch, it is one heck of a job if you're going to peel dry birch bark and separate the layer of the the, the living bark from the uh, from the dead bark on the inside. Winter bark uh, harvesters do go out in the winter when there's not much sap in the tree and they take winter bark because that's the orange colored bark that you can really, the rust colored bark to do your traditional etchings into the bark uh, by scraping that off and the relief creates other patterns and images. Uh, for the most part, uh, if you're not doing it for the artistic style, uh, birch is collected uh, around the time when the fireflies are, are out in the meadows in the fields. So uh, June, early July, uh, when the barks, uh, the sap's really running through and it's, you run a slit up the length of the tree and it just, you pop it off really easy just by even sliding some shims or your hands along that seam that you cut open. Uh, but it's best to have someone come in and do that with you is what I'm trying to get to learn about the process. Uh, and there, since there are communities and very local communities to you that have uh, canoe crafts uh, people there, uh, the arrangement can be made usually a lot more readily than it can with large scale forest industry uh, with the timing of the operations to have people come in and, and do that uh, as recently as the tree is harvested or before the tree is harvested preferably. People can even take the bark off your tree standing in a very special way and your tree will grow, it will regrow its bark, it will be scarred, crusty, black gray bark, it will regrow and it does not kill the tree. And uh, that's one of the ways indigenous harvesters can remove that canoe bark if you're not looking to remove the entire tree. But uh, yeah, I can't sit in a pile uh, drying out for firewood and then try to get the, the bark off it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chris Craig definitely knows Chuck Commanda and uh, one of the more well-known uh, canoe uh, master builders uh, in Eastern Ontario. And Chuck is always looking for canoe cedar and canoe birch and some of his uh, uh, protégés like Stephen Hunter and Bancroft for the uh, community there. They will drive hundreds of kilometers to get to good bark good cedar. I kid you not, that is the value of the product that they're turning those pieces into. Oh, yeah, I had uh, Chuck Amanda at a previous Woodlock conference actually doing demonstration in the hallway. Excellent. Yeah, that was back in the days with the, when we could have live events. <laughs> happen again. Think, yeah, it'll happen again. And it would be great to actually go for a walk in the woods with you at some point and, and learn from you that way as well. That's where it's the most real and, and hands on and it really sinks in, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at to see if there's um excellent presentation. Excellent. I agree with um, way more than I expected. Um, hello, Astrid. Will this presentation be available to send to others? Excellent content and content context. Excellent. Um, so again, this will be posted on our website, and I guess they'll be able to download the PDF if that's okay with you, Ethan. Is that yeah, able to share? I, I had explained uh, one of the differences in in being a, a naturalist speaker is being a storyteller. There isn't a whole lot of written material on the slides or in the the stories, so you're going to have a lot of slides that are just pictures, uh, but you have the recording to go along with it. Um, 
we do have the Algonquins of Ontario have uh, Algonquin background information reports that go in each of the forestry management plans for the SFLs, the Sustainable Forest License Holders in your area, Mazinaw Lanark Forest, um, Ottawa Valley Forest, maybe in Bancroft, Minden Forest may extend a little bit into Eastern Ontario, but there are huge, amazing reports, like 100 page reports, all about values, archeology span that exists in your region, all the historical documentation of where the Algonquin were and what they were doing, et cetera, exist in these publicly available reports that are going to be out to the public very soon for public consultation through the forestry management planning process. So these are documents beyond the slideshow that provide an even more in-depth look at landscapes and all very similar information that I provided exists in the text of those documents. Super. So I can, when they are, again, because they, they haven't been released to the public through the, the planning process phase yet, I can, uh, I can see about providing copies of those in the, in the uh, versions that they exist to ask and have those circulated as well. I think they're uh, uh, just a great resource for, for property with lot owners to have. Yeah, that's super. Yeah, that's and we've also got our certification, certification um, working group. Uh, so we've got lots of partners uh, that are working with us as well. So we've got lots of that are made up of community forests, woodland owners, commercial forest uh, managers. So we can send all that out to them as well. And they'd be really interested in hearing, hearing more, learning more about that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then from there's a question here um, from Jean Saint Pierre. Um, merci for an excellent presentation. Are there publicly available reports or indigenous? of indigenous activities along the South Nation River. There were some findings mm. in the Pendleton area a few decades ago, and the knowledge of the results of these findings could be help, helpful to highlight the cultural value of first residents. Thanks a lot. Yeah, ac ac excellent. Uh, I was gonna say Chris Craig, uh, certainly with South Nation Conservation, he has knowledge of archeological reports out the wazoo and probably knows specifically the site that you're even talking to. Uh, so maybe in confidence, and I mean, sometimes if it's uh, an archeological report filed with the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, you, you, can't, you can't get it, uh, but sometimes people have it and have access to it free to share. So uh, I think, oh, Chris, I think he just popped there in the chat, actually. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so I don't know if Chris, if you wanted to say anything. Don't like to put people on the spot, but. Um... And someone's got their hand up in the top right corner there on my screen. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know what? I can't see the hand popping up on mine. I think it's only the speaker that can. So. Okay, I'm Daniel Leblanc. Um, my woodlot is in Quebec, southwestern, uh, southwestern Quebec. Um, across uh, Cornwall and uh, Lancaster. <clears throat> uh, in our area, the, um, the high um, priority uh, sites for, uh, for indigenous sites are on high moraine sites, mm high -hmm. moraines, because the, uh, the, the Indians or the indigenous people use the shoreline for the, win the summertime and the high moraine sites for winter, uh, uh, for, for wintering. For defense. Um, and also for uh, gardens. Uh, so, uh, on my lot, they found longhouses, pipes, uh, ceramics, uh, carbonated uh, corn seeds, uh, arrowheads, uh, cairns. <laughs> uh, I mean, they found many, many things. So, at least in our area, there are at least six uh, major or Maybe not major, but six good sites of Iroquoisian um, um, artifacts. So, uh, I'm sites in our area are are a good thing to look at. So, I don't know if you mentioned it. I'll, I I I um, I didn't join at the beginning. So. Thank you for that information. Uh, we certainly talked about the uh, the post glacial landscapes and and features from glaci glaciation, like the like moraines and eskers, and any sort of feature like that stands out in a landscape and attracts people to it for various purposes, like you said, for defense, for winter camps because it's way warmer to camp higher than it is down at the bottom of a valley where cold air settles, et cetera, et cetera. 
and along those glacial features are often archaeological sites are found. So having those in your woodlot, it's very important to think about disturbing the ground when you're when you're working or you're making roads or trails that uh, you may encounter that sort of evidence and that archaeological evidence may lead to a much larger site, like in your case. So people are looking for those real key landscape features uh, like those moraines to settle in and to utilize. You're very fortunate to have those values in your woodlot. Yeah, actually, the it's um, there in, in, in the 1400s, 1500s uh, time period. Oh, so that's uh, yeah. I mean, just uh, pre-contact some of that, and then some of it would uh, be into the contact. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Well, there was one question, but it might be a little late now. I didn't want to interrupt the talk. It was back um, early in your talk um, when you showed the village right by the water. And, okay. you, uh, and it was just the question was what it, the homes were covered with. Were, and I and was it was that birch bark, I think, was the question. Yeah, so people, there, there's great debate that I, I have with Indigenous communities and with curators of museums and archaeologists and traditional skills practitioners. People used what they had available. I mean, there's a standard that says, you know, certain groups only use birch bark for their wigwams and their wigwam shaped like this. And the Iroquois only built long houses and they used elm bark, um, uh, basswood bark, things like that. If the Algonquin didn't have birch where they were camping or in built in a village, they would use the bark of the best tree available. The next best bark to get big, huge slats of bark to cover your lodges were basswood and elm at that time and still today. So those species would be used just like birch bark. Um, birch bark was choice because it was easier to actually stitch together and work together. Um, but elm bark and, and uh, basswood bark is much heavier, much thicker and lasted a lot longer and needed uh, less replacing of the bark. But uh, different peoples, different groups, different species, it's what you had available. But most often, uh, the Great Lakes uh, Indigenous, the Anishinaabe people, uh, was the birch tree. But uh, people like the Ojibwe, the Mississauga, often used those other species because birch weren't so prevalent. So they had more access to the elm, to the basswood, et cetera. Even ash, you can use white ash bark off a large diameter white ash. It's not as flexible. It splits really easy. When it dries, but okay, thank you. Um, I think that's about it for questions. Unless somebody has a question they want to uh, speak to, if anybody has raised their hands, do you see anyone raising their hands on your end? Somebody yeah, I don't know if there's. And maybe for me too to follow up. Uh, oh, someone found a hand clap icon. That's neat. I still haven't. I'm used to Zoom. That's all I use in my profession. So I'm still fumbling over uh, WebEx. So I apologize for the annotating. I just I couldn't figure it out and uh, gave up until someone mentioned it. And then uh, it just it stopped my ability from doing other things that I didn't know, like uh, changing slides. So I'll do better the next time in those little yeah. technical aspects. But I'm running with the chat. If we can print, I don't know if there's a way to print or save the chat because there's a lot of people making requests for certain information that I could perhaps follow up directly and provide links or things like that. If I that will, feature is possible. I will figure out a way. I will cut and paste if I need to. I don't think okay. I think when it records, it doesn't actually record the chat, but I can I can cut and paste that. Okay. Yeah, maybe before we close it out, that if yep. we make sure we do that so that I can or yep, for, for sure. you we can follow up in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there was one note here from um, John Hennessy, uh, Jimmy Gwitch, to you and Ethan and all the participants. Looking forward to the next webinar. If you can meet an elder in the community, there's an endless wealth of knowledge to be shared. Far superior absolutely. to searching on the internet, not to mention gaining a new friend. So, yeah. Absolutely. There's the two-way sharing to, to learn it from 
the person uh, from the community and to have that time on the land together and, and share through those resources. There, there's no other way to learn that's that's more efficient and respectful than to get that information from an elder. So if you have that opportunity and that relationship, yeah, cherish that or try to find that. Um, and one more message just came from Robert. Um, he's a woodlot owner and would like to have someone help him check his land to make sure he's keeping it safe. Is any recommendation, recommendations or suggestions for him? And keep yeah, it I mean, safe, I, I'm, I'm guessing in terms of um, um, maintaining the Indigenous values. I'm guessing. Exactly, or predicting if there's yeah. archaeological potential, yeah. etc. And that's the thing, back in my early days of my job, I used to have uh, time to do field work. Uh, I don't know what that is, except for looking out my, my window anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, I used to be able to go to people's lands or crown land pieces and, and do a lot more of those and things, but there are certainly people in your local conservation authorities who might have that training or knowledge. Uh, there could be an Indigenous community, be it the Mohawk or Algonquin communities close by that uh, might have a lands person that would uh, may cruise your property and uh, just let you know if anything jumps out uh, as, as being a value, et cetera, just to give you that comfort uh, as you're managing it. Depending on where you were, I don't know. I, I, I just can't say I'll go and take a look as much as I'd like to. RPFs, yep, that's another good one. They're trained. All I teach tree marker training. Anybody certified as a tree marker uh, in Ontario these days has, has taken these Indigenous values training sessions. So if you can get an RPF for someone from the industry, they most likely have some of these Indigenous values uh, pretty down pat. Or yeah, a tree marker too. You can go mm -hmm, on there. Absolutely. I'm trying to remember which website it is. Um, if you do a, a search for tree markers Ontario, you'll come yeah. up with a page that shows um, the certified tree markers. And they, they would have had to take that course in which you would have taught that component in there, so. Excellent, that, that's a great link to that. Yeah, it's the Ontario tree marker course. Is it under Forest Ontario now? Um, no, but it's, uh, I can't, yeah, I, 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 it's under the government and the Ontario government um, website and uh, um, maybe somebody else, if someone else could help me exactly um, to point, point me in the right direction. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that, and they've got a listing though of all the tree markers that you can, um, it, and I think it's by area as well. So I, and, uh, I can look it up now and let everybody know. <laughs> or yeah, or, and, before uh, just you would or and before you would employ someone like that if they were charging for it, which certainly yeah. probably would, you'd want to know if they just to know that they've had training for indigenous values, or else they're going to tell you a lot about the ecology and and the tree species and what to do with the wood, but to not have that that cultural lens. Okay, well, great. Um, I think that's it for questions. Oh, the course is at treemarking.com. Oh, thanks, Someone Leanna. Just, po just pointed it, uh, just posted that. Leanna did. So thank you, Leanna. Treemarking.com, so you can look that up and uh, they should have the right training there. Okay, and that's, yeah, yeah. I thought so. I just, I yeah. was worried about saying something that I wasn't, yeah, here we go. Martin, and he's the expert in this. Um, it's run by Force Ontario on the CIF. Okay. I thought I, I was worried about leaving someone out if I, <laughs> if I made a guess. So they'll their websites would have the information as well. Okay. Okay, Martin is on there. Hi, Martin. I I, I can't see all the participants at once, but I I knew that because uh, I sit for the uh, for the Algonquins on the uh, Ontario tree marking course, so I was pretty pretty sure it was Forest Ontario and and I didn't realize it yes in conjunction with Canadian Institute of Forestry as well. Under contract from the MNRF. Okay, well thank you yeah. again Ethan and uh, thank you everybody for for coming and um, yeah, and Ethan especially you for taking the time today it was so interesting I loved hearing your stories and um, and Again, I wish we could be in person, but this is sort of a second best and you did a great job. Your, your slides were fantastic. You had really nice pictures. Um, oh, good. Yeah. 
yeah, it went really well. And I didn't, there were no technical glitches as far as I could tell. So very smooth. That's a rarity. <laughs> so um, Jimmy Gwitch, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, I look forward to, to meeting you in person. Thank you to all of you. And uh, actually, I, I, Astrid, we have a couple of times, but I've just been a face in the crowd. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can talk about that later. And thanks for everybody for sharing your energy with me. And it helps motivate me to, to keep doing this work and getting out there and, and sharing and sharing and exploring on my own too. So it's a beautiful day. And if you got nothing else to do, strap on a pair of snowshoes or skis and get out there and look at some trees. All right, so I say uh, see you. So Bamapi, we'll, we'll see you again. Thanks. See you later. Bye bye, everyone. Okay, and Astrid, if uh, just uh, again about the the chat, because I I've.